Chris, uh, so this is my first meeting. Please be gentle. <laughs> so I'm actually a uh, Mug. public speaker. I, I speak a lot of places. 2015. You hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Yes. What, Raspberry Pi. Pie. If you'd like it, Chris. If, you, if you'd rather, there's a microphone there. I can speak loud. It's okay. I hear you just fine. <coughs> Wireless. Video. So. There's the mic. In okay. in in the detection. The about doing, using the Raspberry Pi <laughs> to do a wireless intrusion detection system. See, he said it. Now, who here has worked with Raspberry Pis in the past? Anybody not know what a Raspberry Pi is? OK. So who am I? I've worked in wireless engineering <coughs> since the 90s. Um, I've helped design the first wireless labs at Henry Ford Community College. I got my offensive security professional certification, which means I'm certified to <coughs> handle wireless networks in 2010. <coughs> I used to work for General Motors as a contractor. My job was to walk around their plants, walk across the roof of the buildings, find remote ac find rogue access points, and take a sledgehammer to them. Hmm. So they were pretty strict on the policy in, the, in those plants. You rip it out, you take a sledgehammer, and find the person who put it in place and have them walked out by security. Um, Did you find many? There, there were I only found one. We tried to be nice about it, but the third time it's fine, you know, it became a case of, this is our third time catching you with this. We've told you twice now. Here's my magic band hammer, smash. <laughs> um, by the way, security's here to escort you out of the building. Because the last the, the, the two previous times, he went out to, he took back to the car, he was like, oh, I won't bring it back. Six months later, it's back in place. Um, hmm. I have a bachelor's of science in information and insurance, specifically applied information insurance. That's a fancy way of saying cybersecurity. The apply just means I do digital forensics and incident response. Um, so why are we here? Some people are here because it's, they like Raspberry Pis and they want to learn more and something new. Some people like wireless well, networking and want to learn something new. Who can tell me what that symbol is on the screen? <coughs> the bottom one. Yeah, Tetris. <laughs> no, you guys aren't thinking far enough back. I fight for the user. Tron. 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 I was gonna. <laughs> Um, nobody's ever got that, by the way. Cool. <laughs> Actually, I did. <laughs> I didn't want to say anything. Mostly, yeah. So Tetris is, is everybody's first point, choice, but that is actually Tron's logo. Um, security tools is kind of a joke. I try to be funny. Sometimes I fail. And if everybody get, ever gets that, they give them my Raspberry Pis. Um, so the points of wireless scans, you want to do them for different reasons. The ones I have on the board are just a few of them. The first one is the only thing that ties to regulatory information that I could find, which is PCI DSS, which is really just the payment card industry's data um, security standard. It's not security, it's just a checkbox system to say, yes, I've done all the basics. If it was security, Target wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been breached, Home Depot wouldn't have been breached. It's a case of just, um, you know, it doesn't apply to everybody, but it's, it's one of those things that it's an attempt in the right direction, but it's not enough. They actually need a real security standard, not just what they have. Um, but it does require that there is at least a quarterly scan. So that means that once a quarter, you have to go out and scan your environment and say, no, we don't <coughs> have rogue access points. Or yes, we do have rogue access points. Uh, you want to verify your documentation, especially if you're starting new someplace. You want to come in and be like, what do you do? Who, do you are? Who are you? What, what can you tell me? What's all this magic stuff? Um, you can go through your documentation and say, yes, this is what's supposed to be here. No, this isn't here. Why isn't this here? What's, what is this thing? Did we have a point where we started rolling out access points and never updated our documentation along the way? Or did somebody bring something in and drop it off? Data loss prevention, you know, if you hire a pen, penetration tester, everybody know what a penetration tester is? Yes? Okay. So if you hire somebody like that, they bring in like a Wi-Fi pineapple, which is a little device that they can connect to and connect to your network and start bouncing around. Or some of the other nice tools that they have now that are like pineapples is smaller. Um, they're going to use that to get into your network and start taking the data out. I had a friend who used to go out and get the Nokia 900 cell phones. I think it was like the 990 or whatever it was. It was part tablet, part cell phone. He'd leave them in ceiling tiles. Use those to connect back into the network. Dial into it. And do his testing that way. Hmm. Um, it got expensive because he got these $600 phones everywhere he went and never got them back. Um, 
<laughs> we want to make sure people are complying with the policy. They're not bringing in their cell phone and setting up a data access point on, on their desk. Um, you want to make sure that it's basically a compliance issue. Um, the last two are, well, like I said, you find interesting things like pineapples. And the one that a lot of people from an administration point would use would be find problems before they start. So normally you're going to have a wireless survey, which is when you walk around and see where the wireless, sig what wireless signals are. I installed a wireless network at a place one time. I walked around for three days with a laptop with a giant antenna off of it. And people were like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm building a survey. I'm finding out where the signals things are. It's an office park, you know, I'm seeing lead in from the other suites. And it's like, well, yeah, so this guy over here has their access point. The people across the street have their access point. These people over here. And it lets me find where interference is going to happen before it becomes interference. It also lets me create the survey to set up our own wireless network. So, why the Raspberry Pi for this? Well, there's the, the big player in the market, Cisco, and you got the Raspberry Pi. Hmm. Hmm. So, Cisco is not a very cheap option. In order to build a Cisco solution, and you'll notice that the very first thing, the, the mobility service engine has an asterisk next to it. I'll explain that in the next slide. You're looking at three to four and a half thousand dollars, depending if you're going to go virtual or physical. Now, these numbers came from a Cisco bar that was. Available on, on Google, it's like, here's our prices, here's what it's going to cost you to do these. Mm -hmm. You're going to need at least one LAN controller, and then you're going to have to buy multiple access points. Okay, so look at 150, 162, over $1,000 per access point, looking at $1,000 for your, your controller that sl slides into your nice pretty Cisco switch, and you've got two different choices for your mobility engine. The Raspberry Pi Model B cost me 35 bucks. <laughs> Actually, I bought it for 30. Um, the TP Link, and if you, well, you can't see them now. Hang on. It's just a little USB dongle with an external antenna. And this will do um, half of N, B, and G. Um, power supply is $9. I think the batteries cost me $15. Um, I've got three set up right now, two in the back and one up front, running Raspberry Pis with batteries attached to them, and a case to make it look pretty for a total of nine bucks. Yeah. So when you look at your cost comparison, Cisco wants at least $11,000. Um, $11, mm -hmm. um, Raspberry Pi, 470 It's a four percent cost difference. Now if you notice at the bottom, the SME quoted, the service module or mobility engine, I know a network engineer who was quoted by Cisco, it was going to be $2,000 or $20,000 a site to plug those in. Wow. <laughs> so instead of it being the 1100 it's now 3100 give or take. Or instead of 11000 it's now 31000 give or take. So this is something that, while well, Cisco and other companies have these great big, like Motorola Solutions, Cisco, they have these great big <coughs> things that are, are great and go out and buy these nice expensive solutions, they're not designed for the small people, they're not designed for smaller businesses, um, whereas the Raspberry Pi one, if you're willing to do a little bit of work, it is. So what are these Raspberry Pi running? I'm sure okay, people have said that they've worked with the Raspberry Pis, they know what Raspbian is, right? Now you guys know you can run other operating systems on top of it as long as you can compile. Mm -hmm. So in this case I went with Kali Linux, which is considered the most popular of the pen testing gestures. Um, it's the one that you hear a lot about. It used to be called Backtrack. It was renamed after it was moved from Ubuntu to Debian based. Um, just out, out of curiosity, how many Linux people are here compared to Windows people? Uh, pretty much all Linux. Yeah. Okay. So it used to be based on Ubuntu. They didn't like the way things were going with the Ubuntu package management systems and, and the way Ubuntu was doing things. So the people that ran the Backtrack said, we're going to rebuild this on Debian itself and use the Debian model instead. Um, I chose it because I didn't have to recompile the Loyalist drivers for these. If you ever try compiling anything on a Raspberry Pi, it takes a long time. <laughs> um, so hey, I don't have to recompile the Loyalist driver? Yay for me. Um, Kismet, has anybody ever played with that before? It's a passive packet capture system. A couple of people. And then AeroDump, has anybody ever heard of that before? A couple of people. So, that's also a passive, passive system. Kismet's got this really nice graphical interface that we'll see in a few minutes. Um, actually, in the slide deck. AeroDump is more text-based. Kismet does some of what I needed, but it didn't do everything I needed. 
Aerodump did everything I needed, but didn't make it look pretty. <laughs> so, oh, can, I, can I stop you just for yeah. a second? You're talking about the Cisco solution was like eleven thousand five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Raspberry Pi solution is four hundred seventy. What do you get with that? Is it a? I mean, what 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 am I buying for eleven thousand dollars? Is it a, Cisco's name? Cisco it, support? Oh, no, I understand, but is it? A, 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 I'm buying something for eleven thousand dollars. What does it do? Or I'm buying something for four hundred seventy dollars. What does it do? So it's going to sit there and it's going to passively collect all, in this case, 802.111 traffic. Okay. That's either B, G, or M. Okay. Or half of that. Okay. It's going to sit there and collect it. It's not going to show up at all. So there's an old tool called NetStumbler mm -hmm. that when you ran it, it found the wireless network by saying, hey, I'm here. Who do I connect to? Hey, I'm, who do I connect <coughs> to? This just sits back and says, yeah, just tell me who you are. And what happens, even when you have your wireless turned off so it doesn't beacon out that, hey, I'm here, connect to me. It still has to send packets back and forth to the device it's connected to. Okay. So what Kismet and um, Aerodump and the Cisco solutions do is they sit there passively and just listen to what's going through the air okay. all around us. Detection systems. Yep. Okay. And that's what the so I might skip over that uh, wireless intrusion detection systems. So it's it's detecting wireless systems that aren't supposed to be there. Okay. Um, so. Kismet and narrow dump are both passive and they, right. they do that. Right. They just sit back and listen for it and say, like, hey, tell me about you. Are you there? Mm -hmm. no. They're not saying, hi, look at me. <laughs> um, so they're much more useful in certain situations. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because it's passive, it's more useful in some situations than others. Mm -hmm. So this is what um, the Kismet interface actually looks like if you've never seen it before. This actually started as a project at Eastern University for um, graduation, more or less. I just one credit short. And this is my own credit hour project. <laughs> um, it's like I know nothing about Raspberry Pis, but I know wireless. Let's put the two together. We want to do something more for you, but this is too expensive. And it took more than an hour. So what you see here is the different things that we saw at um, Eastern. I've got a box that's called Rogi, Rogap Pi. It's actually sitting over there. It's not powered on yet. It just sits there, and it's just an access point that people can connect to. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't do anything. Um, you see the plant secure, you see the EMU wireless system, you see things that say hidden SSID. Mm -hmm. It's catching part of the packet, but it's not catching enough to identify what, what it is at that point. Um, so you know it's there, you just don't know what it's called. And then the secure system at Eastern. Um, and of course some lovely error messages at the bottom. Um, I can do a deeper drill into the system on, on Kismet. So I can pull up one specific network, look just at that network, and if you look, it says, who saw it? Now, it's really small text down here at the bottom, but it's I4, I2, and I5, which were the boxes that the access points that saw it. Um, it gives you just one signal strength, so it doesn't let you actually triangulate where that's at. Now, I said, like, PCI, it requires quarterly scans. I don't like that. I want to know what's going on constantly around it. I want to put a system in place that I'm going to be able to sit there and detect wireless networks as they come and go. Because the problem with the, the doing scanning is it's always a snapshot. This solution is designed to be a constant monitor. So that's the other thing that you're buying for this price. Um, this is what it looks like when you log into Aerodelf. In this case, I actually locked into specific, specific boxes. Based on the power level, the negative 91 versus the negative 71, and I didn't capture the third screen. I might have been lost of the stack actually. Um, I could actually use that to figure out where that access point was. And if oh, there's a third screen, negative 59. So I, I go from 91 to 71, 59. So based off that and where things that it was in a triangle situation like now, I knew who was closest to it, so I knew which direction to head it. And based on one, one being over here and one being over there, and this guy being stronger, and this guy right here being even stronger yet, which we'll see in a second, I knew I needed to be on this side of the building going in that direction. Um, here it is. So when we did the live demo from Eastern, I had the drone two sitting in a window, drone three in the hallway outside of it, and then the final drone outside in the hallway further down from the pop machine that drone four or three was sitting on. 
The professor placed the rogue access point further down the hallway just to see if I could prove I could find it. And he actually stuck it up under a bench in the hall. So I knew where to go, I knew where to look. So instead of, if you've ever done a wireless, a wireless scan on your own, you're either walking around with a laptop and an antenna, like you're doing a wireless survey, or some other kind of device that tells you signal strength and you're walking around looking for it. Now, when they see that, they being people that have put access points in, they quickly make phone calls to their buddies, hey, IT's here looking for your stuff again, you better go turn it off before they find it. So you'll see things disappear. Again, why I don't like static or one-time scans and why a constant view of what's going on. Um, this isn't perfect. It doesn't pinpoint exactly to that spot. It's like it's right here. But it's still basic triangulation, and I'm able to go to that area and get there before anybody calls, pull it out, and walk it out the door. Or smash it with a hammer. Um, and that's really the point of that, because I hate walking on rooftops. I'm scared of heights. <laughs> Um, and I'd walk across the rooftop at GM. It's like, I don't want to be up here at all. Can we just go back in now? Yeah, yeah, we're at, we're at the roof. Yeah, I see signals. Let's, let's go back inside yeah. and form on the side. That would be me. Um, <laughs> they're dirty. I've been ran over by a robot. So, you know, all the things I, I talk about. Have you guys seen the Linux Journal article yet? It came out in December. Okay. It finally so, showed up on the, uh, the website. Yeah, it showed up on the website yesterday or? Yesterday, yeah. Um, so it's available free on the Linux Journal website. It's the article that goes with the slide deck. There's a lot of stuff in there that I've left out, like being ran over by robots, hate walking on rooftops, arguing with people who bring stuff in and out, why I hate static scans once a quarter, or once a month, or even once a week, because um, it's too high, it's too easy to hide stuff. Um, there are some limitations. I'm kind of running through this quickly because I want to try to get the live demo. I'm hoping that I, I sacrificed the big chicken today. Um, Kismet's last seen by is hard coded to 10 characters. So if I go back up to the Kismet interface, this final column here, where you've got the I4, the I2, and the I3, that's your last seen by. That's who's seen the signal. But like if you look at the top one, it's like negative 59. But it's always I4 for the first in the first column. It doesn't tell me who saw it last. It doesn't tell me who saw it first. It doesn't tell me who's got the who's got the strongest signal to it. It just says, oh yeah, we see it with a negative 59, and here's all the devices that see it. So it's like I'm missing information. I need more. Are those DBs? Yes, negative DBs. Yeah. But that's why I, I mixed arrow dump into it so I can actually triangulate the stuff off that. But that column is actually limited to 10 characters. So I4 space, I mean, that's nine up there, all well, eight. Mm -hmm. So I could add a space, and I'd have just an I show for the last one. And I4, two, and three, those are drones? Yep. Okay. Um, <coughs> so this is, this, the system is based off of having a server, which is running on the laptop. It should be running <coughs> on the laptop. Um, and the drones are actually spread out around. And we'll go over the configurations on that in a second. Um, but it's, it's hard-coded to 10 characters. So it'll tell me it's there and it can tell me, give me ideas of where to go look. I can get a little bit more information by looking at the individual networks. And it'll tell me, oh, well, I've seen by this one, I've seen by this one, I've seen by this one. But you have to have a name convention that'll make sense. If you have like nine drones, you can do like I1 not through I9. That makes sense. Anything more than that's going to be ugly. And you have places that have naming conventions that are eight characters, that's going to take up your whole field. Um, Kismet's network view, it only shows the strongest signal, it doesn't show all the signals, so that goes back to that problem. And um, if you want to like triangulate things, you actually have to SSH to the drone itself. So those are some of the limitations of it, but that's actually very similar to a lot of the limitations that you buy from the Cisco one. Cisco's going to be a nicer GUI, a little bit better of an interface. But you're still going to have some limitations. You're still going to have to go, it'll tell you where to go look or give you a rough idea where to go look and stuff and play hunt them all. Um, some of the limitations, this particular setup, because of the card I'm using, I can only pick up um, AOC 11B, G, and part of N. And I keep saying part of N because if you actually look at the N standard, it actually takes some of the A space too. So you have N5 gig and N2.0. Uh, 
so A, B, and G, or A works in five gigahertz range, and I'm, I'm blanking on the last half. Anybody wants to help me out, please feel free. Four. Sorry, what? 2.4. Somewhere around there, yeah. But, and it actually crosses both, mm -hmm. and that's how you get the higher throughputs. This will only pick up the 2.4 side. Um, so it's only half of N, even though it says it's N. It doesn't detect Bluetooth. People have asked, does it detect Zigbee? No, those are different frequencies. Um, and it doesn't do cellular, which really doesn't really matter. In certain circumstances, that might matter, but for the original design, it didn't matter. Um, Zigbee would be nice because the new market controllers are coming out, and it's, you can build mesh networks of those and send data around that way, too. Um, Bluetooth, you can set up a Bluetooth network. And I won't be able to detect that, but I might, if you've got Bluetooth plus your Wi-Fi turned on, I'll pick one of those up and then away it goes. So if you wanted to bypass this, you could use Bluetooth or Zigbee. So would the $11,500 solution detect those? <laughs> no, no. no, me either. Wow. So it might pick, depending on which access point you bought, it would pick up either the A and AC, which is the newest standard. It still wouldn't get Bluetooth and it still wouldn't get the Zigbees. There, there is are that a limitation of the TP link? No, that's a limitation of the access points. There are some products that will pick up Bluetooth. Blue Snarf is, uh, they're, they're based on that technology and some other things. Bluetooth one? Yeah. Why, why can't you just get a network uh, wireless card that, that has a full spectrum of N? You can. Mm -hmm. I just didn't have the money for it. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, so it's just right. a function of the... Right, so it's the function of this particular like card. Yeah. Okay. So not the software, but the hardware? Yeah. Okay. So these, those, these are the hardware limitations here. Okay. Software limitations. And then hardware limitations. Okay. Um, things I do want to test in the future. I do want to get a Bluetooth capture device and scan. How um, far does Bluetooth go? You'd have to be close to it. Thirty to sixty feet. Yeah. So that, I mean, if you're going to deploy a Bluetooth sensor network, you're going to be spending a lot of money either way. Um, which not the best solution. So it has limited pickup. You know, again. <laughs> You might pick up somebody's cell phone talking to their laptop. Um, there's a new tool, a new thing coming out called Kisby. It works with Kismet, and its whole point is to pick up the Zigbee frequency. Um, I think Bluetooth was, I could be wrong on this, but 802.15 and the Zigbees were 802.14, somewhere around there. I'd have to recheck the numbers. Um, it's just outside the frequency range of a regular network card. And then this really new, this really cool new thing came out. They're three hundred to four hundred dollars a pop, called the Hack RF One. It's designed for software-defined radio, but it'll scan the entire frequency now, the, the entire range, all the way from ten megahertz all the way up to six gigahertz. So you'll be able to find pretty much anything at that point. You just have to have write software to actually work with it to pick up the software. Sure. But again, that's going to be it's three hundred to four hundred dollars just for the card. Yes. There's a new new one that's out in the last year and a half, two years. It costs about twenty bucks. It goes from twenty four megahertz to about two gigahertz. So I don't it's, it's it goes high enough for me. No, because the A's are gonna be in the five year range. Yeah. You're talking about the T V tuners that people yeah. use for software defined radio. Yeah. Those are nice. Um, there was actually a pretty good presentation yesterday at the Ann Arbor Raspberry Pi group on that. Um, questions? Where does that group meet? Which one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Eastern. Okay. Yeah. Have you uh, tried using the uh, pineapple? No. Okay, because the pineapple kind of set like that where you just tire your router and it can somehow, it might be cheaper than uh, my Raspberry Pi. So, one quick thing I, I should actually clarify on that price comparison. Um, these are the costs for the exact same solution. In this case, the solution is six Raspberry Pis. So that would be six. This is the cost would be for six access points. That makes sense now because I was like, hold on a second. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Those aren't that much. Yes. <laughs> so how does your security job change with... Bring your own device. 
know, bring your own disaster, bring your own dollars, <laughs> call them if you will. Um, I don't know, that's really not my area. So you're, not, you're still going to have to worry about day loss prevention, right? You're still going to have to look at, if you're required by PCI to do the PCI scans. Um, I mean, I guess what I'm wondering is how useful at all is scanning for RF sources when they're everywhere? Well, it goes back to why they're there. <coughs> so you know, in this case, we're looking specifically at wireless networks. Now, we're not trying to be um, the Gaylord Hotel down in Tennessee where we're going to start disconnecting people's access points on their phones. Oh, Marriott. Marriott, Marriott Gaylord, yes. Um, which actually this tool would do if you did it by hand, where it's there's it automatically. Um, but you still need to make sure you, you have policy, whether or not it's, um, trying to think, um, you may have a bring your own device policy, but you're still going to have a policy that goes with what can be done on that device. If they didn't, you wouldn't have things like Good or any of the other, and I don't know the name of the software because it's not my area of expertise, but the things that allow them to take remote control of those devices and do remote wiping from the corporate standard, the, the, corporate, the corporate control tools. So you have your, your wireless phone. You have your phone everywhere. But it's going to be based on what the company's policies say you can and cannot do with your phone. It says that you can't connect your laptop to it during work hours and transfer data. And they see a network access point pop up with your phone's name in it. And you are now connecting it to your laptop. They're going to want to see that, come out and do something about that. One time scan might not catch that, whereas a continuous monitoring system would. Did that answer your question? Or? So you're really talking about behavioral scanning? Mm -hmm. Part of it, yes. Yeah. So, so why are people activating these? I don't understand the motivation of the people, the guy who, who did it three times and I can't. But what's what's the gain for the individual that they they sneak in these access points? So the guy that I dealt with, his office was on the other side of the plant. He was a plant engineer. His job was on the opposite. His office is on the opposite end of the plant. There's a team room for operators to work in inside the plant. And this is a large stamping plant for live wheels and everything else. He didn't have a laptop that he could take with him at the time. What he had was a, a desktop that had all the software on it in the, on the back end. And then he would bring his personal laptop with him with his access point. Hmm. He'd plug that into the team room and then RDP back to his desktop. So he would make design changes, tell it to run on the machine, walk all the way across the plant, look at the part, go back to his desktop, and make the changes again and rerun it. Or, hey, let's do it this way. Let's take my laptop with me. GM doesn't want to give me one. Let's, I'll, I'll bring my own from home. I'll plug in my access point. Now I can talk to my mm -hmm. desktop back at my desk, remotely. and I can do everything. And now I don't have to spend five minutes walking back and forth. So he wasn't, he wasn't doing anything malicious. He just wasn't right. following policy. Right. So he was trying to I save the company money and ended up getting fired. Two main attack vectors of wireless. Yeah. Asking. Yeah. So the attack vector is, even though it's in the middle of the plant, coming on Saturday night, I'm going to be able to pick that up in the parking lot. I now have access into the GM network to do yeah. whatever I want on it. Yeah. Well, <coughs> changes. I have a question though. I know some of you guys work in Ford IT. I work at Ford as well, and I'm in PD, so I don't really know the networks. But we've tried to connect our own computers to the network and the network just won't allow it. It knows right. it's not a Ford computer, so how would this even be possible? Not everybody has that same setup. Oh. Yeah. So I work at I work in Extranet. So we do the external stuff connections to Ford. Um but Ford actually got stuff turned off and set up per MAC address and on, on, so if it doesn't recognize a MAC address it's not going to talk. Right. There's ways around that. Sure. Um, oh, Mac spoofing, I mean yeah. Right. I was going to say it, but yeah. Okay. Um, but there's well, there's some other things that they do on the switch on the switches too. I'm not in that side. I've asked that question in the past. I've been told how they do it in the past. <coughs> um, when I was at GM, that ability wasn't there. Okay. That's something that came out in a later version of iOS. When I was at GM, it was a case of 
it was 2005. Yeah, 2005. So they didn't have the ability to turn Mac ports off, or turn off the individual ports on a switch based on what Mac address okay. to into. Okay. So if you have a business case for connecting something up to the Ford network from an external location or external site, talk to me. I'd like okay. to. Well, this was a long time ago. What we had was they had these devices that could talk to a car and they would eat.